Uh, I'm Manik Varma from Microsoft Research India, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the MSR IISC AI seminar series. Our inaugural lecture will be given by Professor Jitendra Malik from UC Berkeley. It's both a pleasure and a privilege to introduce Jitendra today. I first got to know about Jitendra as he had published some of the most influential papers in the area of texture analysis and computer vision, which is uh, the area in which I was doing my PhD. But then later on, I realized that he had made foundational contributions to many areas of computer vision by introducing normalized cuts, anisotropic diffusion, shape contexts, RCNNs, and so on, for which he has been awarded multiple test of time awards in the form of Longway Higgins prizes, Helmholtz prizes, and so on. And he's also been decorated with the PAMI Distinguished Researcher Award, as well as the IEEE Computer uh, Pioneer Award for his leadership and his pioneering uh, contributions to computer vision. And then later on, I realized that not just that, but Jitendra is also famous in AI because he's received the AAAI Allen Newell Award and the Ijkai Research Excellence in AI Award. And then I, after that, I realized that Jitendra's fame uh, transcends computer science because uh, we are hosting a pure maths professor from Germany. And when I told him about the event today, he immediately exclaimed, oh, Jitendra, from the famous Perona Malik equation. And now I finally realized that Jitendra is well known through all of science and engineering as he's not only a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, but also the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. So Jitendra has been a role model and a mentor to many of us, and his students are star faculty members and famous in their own right at uh, Berkeley, CMU, Stanford, MIT, and so on. And so without further ado, it's a pleasure to yield the floor to Jitendra. Uh, Jitendra, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Manik. Uh, that's a very generous introduction. I cannot possibly attain those heights. So uh, I'm going to talk about learning to walk. So even though this is, uh, I'm most of my career, I worked in computer vision. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've started to work in robotics. And uh, let me say a little bit about why. Why is robotics important for computer vision? So the 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 reason why me, a computer vision person, is now doing robotics. Uh, I think that if we think about intelligence, we have to think about intelligence in an evolutionary sense. And in evolutionary sense, uh, sort of multicellular life emerged like 500 million years ago. That's when you have the first animals. And what they had was the ability to move and the ability to see. And these two abilities go together because what's the benefit of moving? It's that you can go and find food in different kinds of places. But it doesn't help you to be able to move if you don't know where to move to. And that's where uh, vision comes in. So we, there's this famous line from Gibson, we see in order to move and we move in order to see. And it's been argued that this centrality of uh, sort of vision and locomotion coupled together is what enabled a very rapid uh, evolutionary advance in the so-called Cambrian explosion. And then if you come to the last five million years ago, that's when you have the development of uh, modern humans from primates. You have the emergence of bipedalism and so on. And uh, the, the opposable thumb, which meant that there was the opportunity to manipulate tools more effectively. And then in the last 100,000 years of human civilization is when we have language and, and so on. So, if we are talking about intelligence, for most of evolutionary time, intelligence has meant the ability to move and the ability to see and the coupling between the two. So I think that vision doesn't exist in isolation. It exists in this setting. So let's try to therefore uh, uh, study uh, robotic systems. I think that's the true basis of intelligence. Next slide. Okay, so here you're going to see this robot that we developed. And uh, this is a four-legged robot. It is completely autonomous. It has just been told to go forward. And uh, it is uh, managing to do that in a variety of different terrain. Okay. And uh, this robot is, uh, at the, uh, the one which you are seeing right now, is blind. The way it reacts to obstacles is with proprioception because it has sensors on the feet and then of course, it can sense from all its joint angles when it is blocked. 
Okay, here is this robot which is going downstairs. Okay, and uh, to note the main sensory modality here are is proprioception, the knowledge of joint angles, as well as a sensor on the foot which says whether the foot is in contact with the ground or not. And just like in, I mean, the test of walking is that ability to walk in varieties of terrains. And none of these three terrains have been pre-programmed before. And so you see, uh, this is sort of loose mud pile. Next slide. Okay, so this is sort of this grassy ground, but it doesn't know whether there's a dip in the ground and yet the robot can walk. Uh, here's an indoor surface with these planks and it's very uncertain footholds and yet the robot can walk quite effectively. And it can walk at varying speeds and when it walks fast, then you can see there's variety of gates like galloping and so on behavior. And finally, here is the, the version of the system with a camera. And now it is walking with vision. And what you see on the bottom right is its view in the camera. And then above that, you see the top view. Okay, so now, uh, so the structure of this talk is that I'm going to develop four versions of a walking robot. One, which is going to be trained in simulation. And uh, uh, th this is the way uh, reinforcement learning works today, that we need to have a very large number of trials and we cannot do that in the real world. So we're going to train this robot to walk in simulation. The next version of the robot is going to be able to walk in the real world. And uh, this is using this technique called rapid motor adaptation. And this is kind of our answer to adaptive control. And I will talk about that. That's it. And then finally, I will talk about the robot being able to walk at different uh, linear and angular velocities. And finally, the version which has vision and proprioception. And the hardware that we are using here is, is called the A1 robot. And it's a fairly cheap robot. I mean, you can buy this for $10,000. It's manufactured by a Chinese company called Unitree. And this is to be contrasted with what Boston Dynamics has, which is the the very fancy robots, and uh, those are in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And what you will see here is the power of learning. So in a way, you can, in the field of computer vision, about five, seven years ago is when the transition happened between sort of more uh, classical kind of techniques in vision where you uh, designed your features and then uh, 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 worked on top of that to deep learning where it's learning all the way. So in the context of robotics, uh, the competition was with classical control theory ways. And uh, what we are trying to show here is that a fully learning based approach can be more effective than the traditional uh, control theory approach. And uh, but we can draw lots of insights from control theory. And uh, I, I, the talk will give examples of that. So next slide. So this is. This is the, the main technical contribution of the work, which is called rapid mode adaptation, and I'm going to take you through that. So next slide. Okay, so we're going to train this robot to work in, walk in simulation, and this is quite important in this new era of uh, using reinforcement learning in simulation. You need to, so we have a model of our robot, this is quadruped robot, and this terrain, which is like a fractal terrain, and uh, the robot is trained to walk in this with reinforcement learning, which is just a fancy name for trial and error. Basically, you do trial and error, and the approaches which succeed, you do more of, and the ones which don't succeed, where you, which lead you to fall down, you do less of. And the, at the end of the day, all the fancy math reduces to something like that. Next slide. But I want to start with a history of how the attempts to get uh, uh, to understand movement in animals started. And there is a long history of the study of gates. And these gates of animals are like walk and trot and gallop and so forth. For humans, we have two gates, walking and running. And uh, they are periodic in nature. Next slide. And in the early days of uh, uh, sort of the first developments in AI and robotics, 
people started by looking at these gates and and uh, what you see in this slide are the footfall patterns associated with these gates and uh, uh, what uh, uh, so when, when it's a filled circle that means that the foot is down in the ground or uh, or whether it's up in the air so uh, so this leads to uh, this led to the first approaches to trying to develop uh, machines that could walk next slide so uh, the idea was what's called a central pattern generator so the central pattern generator is an idea from neuroscience and basically a uh, walking or swimming or any of these things these are periodic patterns right so sine waves and cosine waves so you can imagine constructing little circuits which are essentially oscillators and then you can tap off from them uh, sort of these harmonic motions and which shifted in phase and if you imagine that you have that applied to the different joints but shifted in phase you could get a machine to walk and and this was the basic idea for these approaches going back to the 80s next slide so uh, so the most successful of these approaches which actually worked in the real world was the so called raybert controller so mark raybert who was a professor at mit at that time and subsequently he founded boston dynamics and this is kind of the leading company in terms of uh, when people think about if you go to youtube and you can find type boston dynamics you will get all their demos of uh, walking quadruped walking uh, uh, biped uh, android and so forth so uh, but it's based on these ideas next slide and uh, there are uh, and uh, uh, boston dynamics is not the only company there are others who have tried to build these machines and of course there's been a lot of work in simulation but what i'm listing here are the most successful efforts which have been shown to work in the real world on a variety of different terrain next slide so typically the setup is that you have uh, you are you are trying to design uh, controllers for these gates so maybe the gate of walking gate of running and so on now let's look at how humans walk in the real world so there is this baby learning to walk and then you see there's human on a rock and all that so where do you see this periodic pattern the so called gate and i would argue that that's not the case in the early stage of life next slide so so we've been uh, looking at the work of karen adolf so she's a psychologist who learns who studies how children learn to walk and this is a slide from her work and basically what she says is that these gates emerge very late at a point when the child has become very skilled in the early stages of movement you really should think of walking as bouts of steps and the next slide will make this even more clear next slide so here's this kid and she's she is walking and no, now observe her foot patterns as she walks uh so uh so what what you should see is this kid takes steps and ss means steps to the side ff means steps to the front b means steps to the back and the kid is basically stumbling but taking these steps it's certainly not this you know nice smooth periodic motion that people have been talking about so what this suggests is that uh, even though there are, the theory is that at least for very primitive animals that these central pattern generators are what you are born with but if we talk about humans we we learn to walk and it is not like there is this pre programmed central pattern generator which is just being executed in the legs the variability that we deal with in our locomotion is far too much okay next slide okay so so our slogan was that we don't believe in pre programmed gates okay next slide okay so we are going to train our uh, uh, robot to work in simulation so we have a this fractal terrain which is in simulation it is a physics simulator we have a model of the the quadruped we think of it like a dog but imagine that this robot dog we have it a model of it in simulation and now we are going to use reinforcement learning so in reinforcement learning you are basically going to issue commands 
So the commands here are denoted by actions A, and then X here denotes the state. So what I've done is something which is in between two, two kinds of notation. So control theory people use X for state and U for action, the control action. And reinforcement learning people use S for state and A for action. And uh, what we have done is something hybrid. We've got X for state and A for action to keep both com communities happy or both communities dissatisfied, whichever way it is. So es essentially what, the, what you're doing is to generate these action commands, which are basically going to be all the joint angles. You're specifying the joint angles of the, for the four legs of the robot. And then this gets fed into a low level PD controller, which deals with the motor torques and so forth. And you, you run this for a billion trials and the robot will learn to walk in simulation. And that is the so-called base policy. Okay, can you hit return? Okay, but there's a little issue here, which is that you do not walk in the same world all the time. So the kind of steps you take should depend on the kind of uh, uh, environmental conditions. So environmental conditions can refer to parameters of the robot, like mass, motor strength, etc. It can refer to parameters of the terrain, like uh, up and down and so forth. It can refer to friction in the ground, things like that. And if you, uh, we, so what the robot should do should depend on the terrain. So next slide. Okay, so therefore, in simulation, life is easy because in simulation, what we can do is we can take all this information about mass, uh, you know, friction, etc., and we can take those parameters which we are going to vary in simulation, encode them into this vector called z sub t, and have that be as another input to the policy. So the policy is like your control law, and it gets two inputs. One input is the standard one, which is uh, uh, the, uh, the, the state and what previous action it took. But the other input is basically capturing the environmental conditions. And therefore, so it's like a, you can have a function with two arguments, right? It's like that. And, uh, and uh, so that's captured in Z sub T. And then this is compressed through this uh, a little neural network, which is the environmental factor encoder. Uh, so this is can be done at training time because at training time you get to control all these parameters like mass, friction, and so on. Next slide. So now we have learned to walk in simulation, and what's important is uh, what, what is the cost function, right? So so in control theory you have like some kind of a cost function. So in uh, in uh, reinforcement learning they call it reward, but it's just a change of sign. And what's the right natural cost function? It is that you don't fall down. And then you minimize your energy. Energy consumption should be minimized. It's important because you are, uh, you're, uh, there's a lot of metabolic cost to, uh, uh, to walking. A lot of your energy in your day is used up in walking, so you want it to be efficient. And then uh, uh, things like uh, contact forces. So you shouldn't be banging the floor too hard, right? Otherwise, you'll be in trouble. So next slide. So that's the cost function, and now you train it in simulation. Okay. Uh, and that's what we did. Okay, so next we have, so now in our uh, you, we do it for a billion trials, and now the robot is able to walk in simulation. And now we want to take that policy, put it on my real robot, and uh, walk it, make it walk in the real world. Next slide. Okay, so in the real world, what it has to deal with is a lot of variations in the terrain, which means there's a variation in these extrinsic parameters. But the, the problem is that we don't know those. In simulation, these uh, parameters like mass and uh, friction, terrain height were known because in simulation we create the environment so we can vary all this. At test time, the robot is walking and it doesn't know all of this. So we are in trouble, okay? And this is called the sim to real gap, simulation to reality gap. Because you have something which works in simulation and then it doesn't work in the real world because the parameters are not the same. And in simulation, you may even have access to this privileged information, but in the real world, you won't have access to this information. So what are we gonna do? 
So uh, these are unavailable. Next slide. So the insights is that somehow we have to find a way to estimate the environment. So how are we going to do that? So and note, by the way, that people talk about the sim to real gap, simulation to reality gap, but actually there is a gap from reality to reality. I can walk on a, on a road and I can walk on, on sand. What enables me to do this? They, they require slightly different walking policies and how can I do this? And if you're going to tell me that it requires vision, I will give you the, the obvious fact that blind people can walk perfectly well. So what is going on is the following. When I walk in sand, suppose you blindfolded me and you put me in sand and then I start to walk. I walk with my normal style. I put my foot down and I lift up my foot. What's going to happen is that in sand, my foot will have sunk more deeply. So when I lift it up and I apply the same force, it won't get out, it won't rise to the same height. So what's going to happen is I am going to issue commands and my body will try to act, but the physical conditions will mean that the consequences of my action will be slightly different. So it'll be different if I'm walking on hard road versus sand. So therefore, what that means is looking at the past history of what actions I commanded and what actually happened must contain a signal for what kind of terrain that I am in. So this past history is what is denoted here by X of T and A of T minus one, right? So you can look at your past 50 time steps of history or whatever. Right now, this is similar to the idea in control theory of an observer. OK, except that this is a nonlinear observer using a neural network, but the concept is somewhat similar. You are trying to estimate from a series of observations over time. So next slide. So so this is what we call the adaptation module. So the adaptation module is like this observer which is running in the background and it takes my last 50 observations in this case, so like maybe like half a second or one second of history. And from this history, it tries to estimate this, this Z sub T. The Z sub T is what we have called the extrinsic uh, vector. It has, in our case, eight dimensional. And what this encodes is the something about the terrain and friction and, uh, and so forth, right? Some of these external environmental parameters. And the point is that these are different from when you're walking in sand versus walking on a hard road. So the goal now is that this adaptation module somehow has to take the last one second of history and use that to estimate Z sub T. And I'm asserting that there is this information in your past history. But how am I going to train the adaptation module? And that's what, uh, next slide. And that's what is uh, shown here in, in this phase two. So phase one, I train in simulation. In phase two, what I'm doing is I'm going to train this adaptation module. Okay, I'm going to fix my policy and train this adaptation module. But how can I do that? Next slide. Okay, this is what I have to train. Next slide. And here is the, the cool, sorry, we go back one slide, please. Okay, so this it can be done in simulation because in simulation, once I've trained my base policy, in simulation, I have access to the ground truth uh, uh, extrinsic parameters, the mass, center, mass, friction, etc. I also have this immediate history, the X of X and A over the last 50 time steps. And what my adaptation module can do is it tries to predict a Z sub T, which is as close to the ground truth Z sub T. So the ground truth Z sub T was obtained by just encoding the environmental ground truth factors. And this Z, Z sub T that I'm training is trying to use the immediate past history of the robot as a proxy for estimating this. It's like an observer, if you will, in control theory sense. And we just run a, it's a regression uh, thing with, and the adaptation module is a simple multi-layer neural network and it can be trained with this. So at this point, we have trained an adaptation module which no longer requires this kind of privileged information about 
mass of the robot, motor strength, which is not going to be available in the real world. But what it will do is the best job possible from the immediate history of the robot's actual movement in the real world. So next slide. So now we have a policy which can be deployed. So at now you take this robot and we put it out in the real world. And in the real world, we have a policy which is trained. We have this adaptation module, which is a little neural network, which is kind of an observer, which takes the immediate past history of the robot's state and actions and uses that to try to estimate this Z sub T. So you should think of Z sub T as this eight dimensional uh, uh, vector, which is like this latent vector, which captures uh, the, some uh, aspects of the environment, like the mass, the friction, things like that. Next slide. And this is the policy. If you hit return, you should see these, this walking. So this is the policy which is now able to walk in all these different terrains. Okay. It's exactly the same program being run all the time. And but what is happening is that as it is moving in these different terrains, this Z sub T is being estimated. And it is being estimated using the immediate past history of the robot. Okay, and you can see the variety in terrain. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so I'll give you a demo of this. And here what's happening is this robot is going to try to walk on the slippery surface. And Ashish, who should be on the call, is uh, uh, he's doing this experiment where what he does is he puts some oil on this slippery surface. So the whole idea is that the the same policy would not. So there is this is olive oil being wasted on the surface. So it will try to walk and initially it will try it will start to slip, but that slipping will give it the signal for estimating that it is in a different environmental condition. So did you please hit return? And there's actually plastic on the shoe. So it starts to slip and then it uh, manages to recover. So uh, keep hitting return. So you uh, saw this demo of this. Uh, uh, okay, hopefully it, we, we don't need to see. You, you got the flavor of the video kept to playing, right? So basically the robot is adapting to slippery ground as well as to this increased weight. And the way it does it is by the estimation of this Z sub T. Uh, next slide. Actually, can I ask a question here quickly? Uh, yeah, sure. So, so it's very impressive what this is able to do. Uh, I'm sure there are such situations that it can't cope up with. My question is, what happens then? Does it keep trying ad infinitum, or does it, uh, you know, tip over and fall? Like, you know, what is the failure mode here? Yeah, I, I mean, the failure mode is falling, obviously. Uh, and but the basic setup is what is important for success here is that. There is a very, very rich variety of conditions during training. So what it encounters in the real world, there should be a proxy of it in simulation. Now, in simulation, we don't really have these slippery, oily surfaces and so on. But what you are getting is you, 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 that there is some condition which is somehow metameric or equivalent to the kind of condition that that you're going to get here. That, right. That's the basic idea. Right. And if it Thank goes you. outside that, then of course there will there could be failure. Thank you. Okay. So, so, so it, the audience. I use the term metamer in the sense that in color, you can have two different lights which look the same to a human observer. So there can be two different mechanical conditions which are functionally equivalent. So you might be able to trade off greater mass with lower friction and so on and so forth. Jitendra, a few more questions from the audience. One is from Srinath, right? Um, question is, are there separate reinforcement loops for each leg? And if so, how is the stability of the overall organism, organism model? No. Can the actions of one leg conflict with the other leg? No, the, all the legs are trained simultaneously. So the reinforcement policy, the action is a vector. Which is which refers to all the legs or all the joints of the legs at the same time. So the training right. is done in this multidimensional space. So we are not training legs independently. They are all being trained together. 
Got it. And another follow-up question is, is the adaptation module also an RL component? No, the adaptation module is a simple neural network, which is taking the past uh, 50 time steps history and from that, it is trying to estimate this vector Z sub T. So it's a simple supervised learning module trained with, it's a, yeah, it's like a little neural network trained in a supervised way with when you're, you're given some input output pairs and you train the network with back propagation. Okay, so it you. does not require trial and error. I, reinforcement learning is obviously about trial and error. This is gradient descent training. Okay. So uh, I think that this slide tries to show how these parameters uh, are estimated and, and so on. But I think we can skip that in the interest of time. Let's keep moving. So you, what you, uh, so this is, this will try to show whether or not we put in this adaptation, I mean, the effect of that. So next slide. So if we don't have this adaptation module, then this robot fails, okay? And uh, and then uh, with with adaptation it works. I mean, so this is of course a very anecdotal example, but we have systematic experiments which uh, study this. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this this is a surface where when you press your foot down, it presses in. So with RMA it works. RMA is rapid motor adaptation. But without adaptation, uh, you have trouble. Next slide. And then this robot comes with its built-in controller and, and uh, you will find that it doesn't do that well and RMA does. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, so uh, there. So look at this, which is an example of walking on planks. Ne keep going. And this is certainly not there. I mean, there are no planks in the simulation uh, environment. But what I'm saying is there is something which is a proxy to that. And by this adaptation module, you are you're you're changing. You are quickly adapting to the conditions by estimating z. So anyway, again, those of you who are control theory people would, there's this area called adaptive control. And here, uh, and that deals with like these parameters, which may be time varying and so on. Here, what we are doing is uh, something which is morally equivalent to that, but using, uh, using neural networks and uh, deep learning, basically. Okay, next slide. And I won't go into more details, but these are like systematic studies comparing to other approaches. So one of the, like the classic control theory approach would be what's called system ID. And system ID tries to solve too hard a problem. It tries to estimate all those parameters, which in fact may not be identifiable and it doesn't work as well. Another style of approach that people have done is what's called domain randomization, which is that you, you, you make your policy robust but robust policy does not perform as well because it's trying to use the same policy under all conditions. What we are doing is we estimate what condition we are in and then we have a essentially, a, and that goes in as an argument to the policy and you do different behaviors in different settings. Next slide. Okay, so let's skip this because this is numbers. You can read the paper. Now, I, I should mention that quadruped locomotion is considered an easier problem than biped locomotion. And we have had a collaboration with uh, Kaushal Srinath's lab, who is uh, also at Berkeley, and uh, he's a mechanical engineer, and his group works on uh, locomotion in various settings, from typically from a control theory perspective. So can you hit return here? Hopefully this video will play. So the robot is being instructed to walk sideways or backwards or uh, whatever. 
and this is a more challenging problem as you can see because walking on two legs is harder than walking on four legs and here is a setup where and but it's the basic idea of rma and here what's been done is some slippery surface with oil and water underneath and it slips but it recovers and this is thanks to rma Okay, so uh, so the point of this was to show that we have been able to do this for quadrupeds and for bipeds. Uh, the next thing which I wanted to show was that so far I had the robot work only at one desired speed. We specified that okay, you're you're supposed to walk at 0.35 meters per second. So what if you train the robot with different target speeds and then you distill that into one uh, into one policy? And similarly, we don't want to have just a robot which goes linearly straight forward. You want it to be able to yaw, go at different angular velocities, so turn in different directions. So it's more or it's exactly the same machinery, but now you just set different target speeds uh, in terms of linear velocity or angular velocity and train, and then you can put it all into one policy. So let's see what happens. Next slide. Just a quick question before you jump to the left. Is it okay? Yeah. Um, Nipun Quatra from Microsoft Research uh, as a question. So how important is phase one of simulation training? That is, does, um, does it really need to explicitly pass the extrinsic parameters or is the state action history used in phase two enough? No, it's the, the, uh, the simulation is absolutely important. We can't do anything without simulation. So in simulation, we are doing two things. One is we are training the basic policy for walking. And then we are also training this adaptation module, which is going, which uh, which is going to use the immediate past history to figure out the extrinsics. So both of these are trained in simulation, and then in deployment we do no training after that. So once it the robot is put in the real world, there is no more learning, no more training. Both of those have been trained in simulation. So the, 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 there are people who work where they're trying to do some of the training in real, the real world, but our logic is that real world training, real world learning is risky, right? Because this is a mechanical robot. So every time it falls, there's a chance that the leg will break and you'll have to replace the motors and so on. But in simulation, if it falls, there's no problem. So our whole approach is to do everything in simulation, put it out in the real world, you press play, it should play. And how realistic is the current simulation tools, especially for training uh, the robots today? So, so they are uh, incredibly good. I think that they are, uh, I mean, that is what this proves actually. This experimental study proves that. And uh, and this was not would not have been true 10 years ago. I right. think the quality of physical simulation has really improved. And it's a bit more challenging in the setting of manipulation, but for walking, these tools seem to work really well. Because we have now done it for a couple, several different settings. Yeah, thanks, Jitendra. Next slide. Uh, so now you should see uh, this robot, which is being trained to walk at different angle, linear and angular velocities in the real world. Uh, not able to play this one. So I will go to the next slide then. Okay, sure. So I'm assuming that we have the next half an hour and I'll cut into the question time because we started late. So press play here. So what you should see are these different walking, trotting and galloping and the, uh, the, the, the what is seen underneath the video is the footfall pattern. And the footfall pattern is different for these different gates. So when you have uh, this the, on the right, you have this very fast gait, this uh, galloping. In that, uh, there are times when all the four feet are above the ground. I mean, this is the distinction in human walking versus running as well, right? In walking, always there's a foot on the ground, right? Okay, so, uh, so but note that we did not program any of these gates. This walk and trot and gallop they were not programmed. They just emerged. So that is the magical part here. Nothing was, there was no control law programmed which corresponded to this pattern of foot movement and so on. 
all that emerged all that we did was we did a reinforcement learning with a certain cost function and the cost function said go at such and such speed and you are trying to minimize energy while you are trying to uh, do this and uh, next slide so the, that's the question why do we get different uh, gates and the answer it turns out is that it just emerges that uh, out of energy consumption so next slide so uh, if you remember when we were training the robot to walk in simulation we have to give it a cost function and the cost function is don't fall and minimize your energetic consumption right in terms of you know the standard physics notion of energy and minimize the impact at which your your feet are hitting the ground and that's it and uh, next slide and this has been studied by people in biomechanics when I mean, they've studied the movements of animals the people who do these experiments with horses and then they put some bag on their mouth and they can measure the oxygen consumption and from that figure out how much energy is being consumed and basically they have told us that uh, at slow speeds walking is optimal energetically so that curve you see on the top left is the curve of energy consumption and it's a minimum uh, for that uh, at that speed for walking and then at a different speed for trotting and at a different speed for galloping so an animal which wants to move at a certain speed and that speed could be dictated by the need of the task like if a tiger is trying to catch a deer it has to move very fast right so even though moving faster uses more energy it doesn't have a choice otherwise it's not going to be able to catch the prey and then it's going to switch to a different gate because that is more energetically efficient so this had been observed by people in biomechanics next slide and and what we found is that we got exactly the same behavior in our robot the difference is we did not need to pre program these this is quote emergent behavior okay just from the cost function you got different solutions in different regimes so this is nice people always say about learning that you pre program it and there's but no uh, you pre program something quite limited which is minimize energy and then at in de for different speeds different kinds of gates just emerged next slide so there are more results which uh, let's uh, just just play them if they are play, managed to play so uh, basically what uh, what we have done is we have told the robot to go at a certain at some speed and at different speeds you get this different behavior and notice it's pretty moving pretty fast so this guy who's running with the robot has to sort of really run okay next slide so here is a policy where we've just told it to go at varying speeds and the, it adjusts the policy so so these are the footfall patterns so notice that so basically uh, so going back to the original point that i made which is that we did not want to pre program gates we just wanted to learn to walk while minimizing energy and foot uh, ground uh, reaction forces and so it learns this flexible behavior so it can work on this setting where you can't talk about what's happening here as a, a gallop or a trot or anything like that but when you are on constant ground con constant conditions and you are trying to go at a certain speed the the traditional gates just emerge next slide okay so now it's the last part of my talk and i'm going to take probably 5 7 minutes over it so we'll have time for questions i think manik told me that there is an hour and a half kept for this so now we have added vision so so far it was blind walking so what's the benefit of uh, vision vision enables us to go somewhere navigation we refer to this as navigation right we you use google maps to navigate to a certain goal and this robot is doing that so this robot has just been told go north go northeast uh, 57 meters and it has to manage to do that while uh, while avoiding colliding with obstacles so so that's where vision is going to come in so it's give, told a point goal go 900 200 meters northeast 
And these obstacles are not known to the robot, right? The robot doesn't have access to a map. So it's going to have to see with its camera, build a depth map. And so it will have an incremental partial map with which it uses for planning and then it keep going. Next slide. And and there's there are a couple of subtleties because navigation has been studied a lot, but for wheeled robots. In the context of a walking robot, you actually have more flexibility because there are more terrains where we can walk than where, where we can go with wheels. For example, stairs, right? And if there's an obstacle, a wheeled robot cannot do anything over it. But if you have legs, you can step over the obstacle. So in fact, navigation and locomotion behavior can be coupled. And then, of course, we use vision, but we also have proprioception because in the earlier part of this talk, I talked about essentially how a blind person can walk, which is through the help of uh, proprioception, knowledge of your own body, the various joint angles and so on. So let's try to use this in the same way. Next slide. OK, so this is a paper which should, uh, which is trying to do that. And uh, uh, let's go to the next slide. So we start with a robot which is able to move at any speed, any linear velocity, as well as any angular velocity, which is this your rate in terms of omega. So we have trained that using the techniques I've already described. Next slide. OK, so how do we plan a path? Next slide. So the visual planner, there is this occupancy map, which is not known to the robot. And But if it was known, then there would be a cost map that you could plan. Basically, you want to stay away from obstacles and you want to sort of go follow the geodesics in this space. Right. So there's something called this fast marching methods, which can be used for figuring this out. And there's a, there's a nice mathematical theory here developed by James Sethian. OK, uh, next slide. So uh, what we are going to do is uh, we so the, the robot is moving and what you see in the bottom right is what the robot sees. And what you see at the top right is the partial map that it has built up of obstacles and free space. And from that, it sort of figures out the geodesic. So what's the the minimum cost path, which will try which will obviously try to avoid the obstacles automatically. And it is, of course, given where to go to, which is in terms of like 200 meters northeast. And then everything else emerges. So there's no prior map. OK, only the direction go 200 meters northeast while avoiding obstacles. And the map is being built up incrementally. And you see that map and the map is not complete. You see that on the top right. It's just partial. It's around the path that the robot took. Next slide. So, uh, but there are a couple of subtleties here, which is uh, that, uh, and just let's think about this. How fast should you walk? How fast do people walk? So if I am on treacherous terrain, like I'm on a hike and then there are all these rocks and boulders, I'll walk more carefully. If I'm on flat ground, which I know very well, I'll walk much faster, right? So somehow that's uh, something we need to have in our ability. And uh, let's see, Let next slide. So here's this robot walking. It's being told to walk straight. And then it encounters these planks. So it turns out that there's a very simple way to estimate what speed to go at. You run an estimator of, if I keep going like this, what's the probability that I will fall? And you can train that in simulation as well. And once you, if that probability that you will fall is high, then what you do is you lower your speed. So this is pretty intuitive. I mean, we as humans do this, right? If I start to fall, I, I become more careful. And the nice thing is that not, this doesn't need to be pre-programmed. It just emerges from a learning system which has estimated the probability of fall in simulation. And here's a little another aspect, which is that we use vision, but we when we move, we make use of both vision and proprioception. So this robot has collided with this glass door. And the thing is that glass is transparent, so the vision system doesn't see it. But when it is not able to move, 
it realizes that obviously there is uh, there is an obstacle there. It constructs in the changes its map appropriately, and then it finds a way around the obstacle. So next slide. And and we 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 can uh, train this uh, as well, and uh, and that's basically it. So this fall predictor and collision detector, they enable us to working on top of this these policies enable us to uh, develop this uh, this full system. Next slide. And and these are some demos which show that. It is actually advantageous to use multiple senses. Don't just use vision. Don't just use proprioception. The system works better with both. So because vision will fail in certain conditions, right? Like transparent glass. Next slide. And uh, here are just more demos, but I think in the interest of time, we should probably skip them. So uh, next slide. So. Uh, yeah, so this is the the collision detector with with which uh, so it's figured out that there is it's not able to move, so therefore it decides that there must be an obstacle and it finds a way around it. Next slide. Okay, so now uh, notice that the terrain it just sees what it sees. It, uh, there's no prior knowledge, no prior map. Okay. And it's just been told go 200 meters northeast. It couldn't detect this obstacle because this guy showed up just immediately in front. But when it couldn't move, it knew that there was an obstacle, and so it found a way. Okay, uh, these are details which you can find on our archive paper. Next slide. Keep going. OK, uh, so I'll, this is kind of the uh, final slide, which uh, that people in neuroscience and in robotics have talked about layered architectures before, which is that we want some low level capability, which is like moving and then you on top of it, you have a capability like collision avoidance. And then on top of it, you have an ability like going to a desired location. And evolution always. Uh, Evolution is like a hacker. It adds stuff. It very, it's very kludgy. It is not like one elegant design. And and this robot has been designed in that way. I showed you different versions of it. And uh, the the difference here is that we have done it in a learning framework. And uh, it's a synthesis of ideas which have been around in neuroscience from uh, someone called Valentino Breitenberg. He had this book called Vehicles, which I recommend, and people like Rod Brooks going back to the 1980s of layered architectures. But by combining these ideas with learning, we get something much more effective. And uh, and that's, uh, I mean, the core engine for us was this uh, idea of rapid motor adaptation. And uh, we are now exploring it in many different settings, such as for example, manipulation tasks and so on. But I think I've talked too long and I will stop here. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take questions still whenever people want to ask questions. Yeah, can you hear me? Can I ask yeah. you a question? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, excellent talk and it's very nice to see it uh, going on different types of terrains. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had a very basic question on that uh, position, position control that you used. Uh, so I understand the reason why you did not go for reference trajectories, right? Because you didn't want to uh, learn these periodic behaviors. It has to be emergent. Yes. Uh, what, about, what about position control? Because maybe we can go for torque control. So why, why did you go for uh, PD control for tracking? So, so the lowest level, we didn't want to basically deal with that, right? So so at, so there is, so what we are doing is basically specifying, so we are specifying the uh, trajectories for the joints, right? So all the joint angles are being specified, uh, joint angles and their velocities. So that is the command, that is what this our policy produces. It says this joint angle should be, you know, 0.7 radians and this joint angle should be 1.9 radians at this moment in time. And then at the next moment in time, it's going to give 
some other uh, vector of joint angles. So that is being produced by this high-level policy, but this is not directly being used by the motors. Okay, in between you have a PD controller. So it's the simplest thing which come just comes with the robot. One can put fancier things there, but the what the the controller will do, the low-level controller will do is it'll do some smooth smoothing and so forth, right? And it'll uh, try it'll run a little you know, a standard feedback control loop to try to attain those objectives. So at that level, it is kind of like trajectory control, right? Okay, okay. So you are going to a position, but you're not explicitly using torque as actions. Uh, actions right. are uh, position commands and they're converted to, convert to torques. Yeah, using... that's being done by the low level guy, yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, okay, and the comparison was made with A1. Now, but what was the controller in A1? What, what was the controller? Well, whatever the manufacturer uh, came up with. So, right, oh. so we don't know. Uh, and uh, of course, I mean, there is a, I mean, huge literature in the walking community, right? So there have been, uh, I mean, there have been papers written on different kinds of controllers that have been designed over the last 20, 30 years. And uh, so people like Dan Kodicek's lab and then, there's a there's a MIT group called the Cheetah group. So there are maybe five or six groups which are prominent in this field, and who have operated more in the style of designing controllers, uh, uh, right? Like there's a zero motion point, moment moment point and so forth. And the number of people who have tried to do uh, uh, learning for for walking, uh, they are very few. So there is this group from Zurich called the animal group, and they have shown their robot is trained with reinforcement learning and it walks out in the world. I mean, the big difference between theirs and ours is that we use this idea of rapid motor adaptation and we do not program the footfalls that they do. So it's ours is, I guess, more pure learning, if you will. Uh, and there have been other learning approaches which just work in simulation, but that's not satisfying, right? I mean, I think the proof is that it should work in the real world. Yeah, it should, it should. we have a few questions from audience. Uh, one of them is, how do you simulate or learn the concept of danger? For example, a larger animal chasing and its impact. Okay, so in our uh, uh, setup, I mean, so obviously that's a more high level question and I don't have an answer to it right here, but I have in our setup, there's a very low level concept of danger. Danger is, am I going to fall down? Okay. In simulation, we actually have ground truth for danger because we are going to run a trajectory and the robot is going to walk and then at some point it either falls down or it doesn't fall down. So, so right, you, you, in the future, you will know what actually happened. Okay, so this is all in simulation. So now I can say, if a certain trajectory lands up with me falling down, that means that one second before that, I have uh, now I know that okay I'm going to fall down in one second. All right. So I have now accumulated a lot of this kind of experience, and this experience enables me to predict when I'm going to fall. And now when I have my policy, it can be smarter. What it can say is oh. I'm likely to fall at one in one second if I continue doing what I'm doing. So let me not do that. Let me just reduce my speed. So basically, that's our. I mean, there can be fancier things, but uh, our thing is, you just go slower. You're less likely to fall. Yeah, and in the in the the current implementation, right? Do you support extending this definition of falling down as one danger state, right, to other states? Yeah, so I mean, more. Uh, so we have. So what have we learned? We have learned uh, two things right now, and actually three things. I would say we learned from simulation. One was, uh, one was these extrinsics. These were quite critical. So this is like some kind of compact summary of the environment. So we learned that. Second thing we learned was, am I about to fall? The third thing we learned was, have I collided with some object? Because I, I'm trying to move, but I can't move. That's what happened in the glass door. And right. all three of these were learned in simulation. And once you have learned them, then they just uh, are 
operating and you're controlling your behavior. Now, this list is arbitrary. I've just stopped at three, but why could it not be more? Right. And, and you brought report, up, we haven't done that yet. Yeah, you brought up this very important part about extrinsics, right? Uh, where simulation plays a key role in kind of modeling the environment. Uh, what, how do you, what are your thoughts when this is not the same, right? The real world does not match the simulation, especially when you don't have simulation environments, right? For all type of terrains. How do, yeah, how do you so this is, this is a framework? fundamental question about, uh, you know, like, can every behavior be trained in simulation? Yeah. So, I mean, I, obviously, you, you can see what we have in simulation. We have this fractal terrain, and we vary things like friction, mass, etc. So there is nothing there corresponding to sand, right? There is nothing there corresponding to stairs. So that would suggest that it should not work in those conditions. Okay, on the slippery oil surface. So what's happening is that there's something which is saving us. Why we are hitting lucky? We are hitting lucky because I think there is a concept of equivalence. Something in simulation which is kind of like what will be in the real world. Okay. And uh, I, I want to give an analogy to, I mean, in, in uh, uh, if, I mean, from your people's knowledge of, say, fluid mechanics and so on. There are certain parameters like uh, Reynolds number, Froude number, things like this, right? And they come in a certain ratio. And what happens is that there can be different conditions which are equivalent because the Reynolds number is the same. And this right. enables people, for example, to simulate study airplane flight in wind tunnels where the conditions are not exactly the same as the real airplane, right? I mean, your wind tunnel is smaller, right? But yeah. but people use wind tunnels, and they their consequence, and they and I mean, they don't. I mean, they can do it by math with uh, Navier Stokes, but they also do experimental studies, and those are equivalent, even though they are not the same. So that is what is, I think is happening underneath the hood that there are conditions in simulation which are equivalent to what you will have in the real world. Now, if you actually encounter something in the real world which is not equivalent to anything in in simulation, then you are going to be in trouble. All right. And, and your theory is that this equivalence and approximations are sufficient to adapt to real world. Correct. Yeah. But I can't do a theorem on this. This is, right. this is an experimental statement. Right. Yeah. Venkat has a follow-up question. Venkat? Yeah, actually related to that, and I think it's related to my earlier question as well. So when you have uh, some a situation that is not equivalent to anything that you saw in simulation, uh, what is the process by which you uh, extend the simulation so that next time it works better? Is it um, a, a human expert has to figure it out, or is there a way of sort of in an automated or semi-automated way extending the simulation? incorporate new uh, situations no so we have not studied this at all but uh, but i mean i can just like i can just speculate on the spot as to what you do i mean if you if you log your behavior in the real world okay then you uh, you can find the places where you go wrong right and and then and then we can start from that and basically the goal would be i, I think that people use this term digital twin that there is reality and there is this simulation world, and we are trying to make the simulated world better and better, right? So once we log places where the the which events and it, that happened in the real world for which there was no counterpart in the simulation, then I need to upgrade my simulator. And this is a problem in many different settings. This is not unique to us, right? So yeah, some I mean, trying to train a self-driving like car. That's correct. Yeah, you have but a simulator, and the simulator doesn't capture some of the real world uh, events. Correct. No, my question was: yeah, certainly, logging is one part of it, but after the logging is done, does a human have to understand what this logs represent as a new situation and then extend the simulator, or is there a data-driven automatic way of? Uh, I mean, it, it's a fair question. I don't know the answer to that. Right. I mean, right. I don't. I because I've not worked on it. I. I mean, I. Yeah. Alright. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Rowan has a question. Rowan? Sure, I think just to you know follow up on the last question, maybe epistemic uncertainty and making the distinction between epistemic uncertainty and aleatoric uncertainty might yeah. be 
you know an answer to at least the first part of it like can we yeah. even detect something which is just completely od and then sort of deal with it so jitend i just wanted to engage with you on just you know a few more broader questions so one direction to grow this work this beautiful work on control and and learning motion is perception and adding sensing right the other direction is probably planning um so i just want to know your thoughts on you know, learning goal condition policies at the moment you don't have essentially you know a notion of a goal but the, is there a way to to you know condition on high level goals like for example escaping for a quad, quadruped from from the door is a different task than escaping from the window maybe you know jumping over and things like yeah. that so do you do you feel there are thoughts on you know what are the challenges there possibly composition of controllers might be a, a crucial thing just as dan kordichek has been talking about forward chaining of controllers do, do you see some challenges in that line uh, yeah so uh, uh, that's a good point so it's essentially like getting to planning so what what i am what we are doing here is we have some uh, we we do have some notion of you know one of the parameters into the policy is at what speed do you go and what direction you want to go right so those are there but but i think you're talking about at a higher level of abstraction right yeah galloping for a bit then jumping over then you yeah. know jumping again right uh, right so so that gets into planning so so the way i think about it is that humans have skills which are like control loops which have become we have become very good at like walking running jumping and then there are situations where we improvise and combine from this repertoire of skills right and now this feels more high level all right it feels so in the robotics <laughs> literature in ai they call this task and motion planning where task planning is really at this higher level of abstraction and motion planning is more at this lower level of abstraction so what we are doing is motion planning not task planning and the the challenge there is that your i think that there is a this is there is a classic disconnect between sort of the ai style task planning and the the low level skills right and the disconnect is that the classical ai style they just assume that everything <clears throat> will work okay and the plans are made that way but every step will not work right now if you compose everything to, if you if you you can create it end to end but that is not a, a scalable solution you contain one policy which has first walking then jumping then walking but how many com- i mean the number of possibilities grows exponentially so, so i think i think we need is we need to have planning and then we need to just figure out how to stitch skills together so you have a behavior one behavior two and then there needs to be a smooth transition which itself needs to be trained so so we are trying to do some work like that in the context of manipulation but i feel that this is one of the, the big problems that has not been solved yeah. because there are so there are two communities <laughs> the planning type people and the reinforcement learning type people and they yeah. operate in their separate worlds and each are happy the reinforcement learning people have talked about hierarchical rl and forever but none of that stuff works okay at least my bold assertion is that that really doesn't <laughs> work i mean so so that remains very much a research topic but let's consider something in the middle right so one is you know pure planning or task task and motion planning or tmp and one is control right but going back to the final few videos that you showed which was about making contact yeah so so let's say i've been pushing against a cardboard box and like repositioning it is probably something in the in the middle and i think that is closer to all the beautiful work that you know pulkit and you have been doing on learning forward dynamics and inverse yeah. dynamics models and things like that um so is there is there like a you know an opportunity there to 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 learn these interactions and have some sort of a you know move the obstacle around in order to make your path uh, clear to go forward right that that might be at yeah. the intersection i'm not sure whether to call it on this side or the other side on the planning side no. but could be there no i i i i except that i mean i i agree with your statement yeah. i i think that but i don't know how to do it <laughs> yeah. this is the, this is the this is one of the areas which is active yeah. research and uh, you know there are problems where i feel okay i think i know how to do it it's just a question of detail and there are areas where i feel okay this is a wild territory this is a jungle 
And this feels yeah. to me like a jungle. Okay. All right. So let's go to you know broad question number two. So you talked about control, right? You motivated a lot from control theory. You refer to control theory in, in the number of ways. You know, one of the crucial parts of control theory is guarantees, right? So in in this framework about guarantees and you know safety controller certification etc. Do you, do you see these guarantees coming into the you know, the controllers that you are talking about, the adaptations and equivalent to Lyapunov of control barriers and things of that kind? Um, yeah. A rust direct flavor of doing certifications, et cetera, because that's going to be also you know important. Um, I don't know. I just want uh, to yes, uh, I believe so. Uh, and right now we don't have that. Yeah, so it's a guarantees are still hard to 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 have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right now this whole process is uh, is just empirical, and I, I think think of it like in medicine. Okay, in medicine, what guarantees do you have that the drug that you are getting is going to help you? No, they just do experiments and control trials, and and then but you're relying on your life on those things, right? So right. I, I'm not trying to be glib, but I'm saying that in the short run. We have this trade-off that the controllers for which we have guarantees, they are simply not able to do lots of things we want them to do. Okay, right. the the controllers from trained from uh, this style of uh, sort of <clears throat> learning-based approaches can do a lot more cool things, but you have no guarantees. So now you pick your poison. I yeah, feel I think... that over time we will develop uh, better experimental techniques. Right. I mean, we, we, you know, like we can find statistical ways of guaranteeing behavior. And that will be an adjunct to the more formal methods, which are more, uh, you know, the, the classical control has mathematical guarantees in a certain way. And but those are all predicated on certain assumptions on the model and all that. And when things fail, it's often not because your model goes wrong. Right. So, yeah. so yes, you have your your guarantee from your Lyapunov function, but what's the guarantee that your model is right? Well, the control theory people will say if it is within bounded by such and such, then my theorem saves me. But yeah. what if it is not bounded by this? I'm just saying that anybody, when you push hard enough, there is a yeah. <laughs> there is a weak point. Yeah. Finally, wanted your thoughts on you know just conceptual placement of uh, RMA, right? How does this relate to meta learning? I think the paper also talks about a little bit of meta learning, but Chelsea Finn style adaptation and manipulation. Um, there is some kind of a distillation that has happened in simulation and adaptation online. Meta learning also has that flavor, but you know, just for for our clarity, could you say a few things on the connections between the? Yeah, two? I, 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 to me, meta learning is every, all things to all people. So, it's meta means just learning about learning, right? So. So, uh, so lots of, lots of, lots of specific projects can fall under that umbrella, and uh, I think I would say what we have is a kind of meta learning because we are there is a basic policy and then you're learning the an argument to the policy, if you will, which is estimate. And uh, I, I, I don't, I find the term meta learning is too general. When I try to explain this idea, I try to do it in terms of observers. I think the yeah. control theory yeah. people had this idea of an observer, and that's very precise. I mean, you know, Kalman was totally precise. Now you just take that idea and you fuzz it up a little bit and you throw in a few layers of a neural network. And but you take that high level philosophy. I think that explains what we are doing. Yeah, but I think the variation you have in the terrains in simulation has a flavor of meta learning, right? Because yeah. we haven't talked about that in this, this presentation. But if that distribution is very little or biased, then the observer will yeah. may not be able to correct. It's yeah. really predicated on that. Great, thanks, thanks. Uh, I think I'll hand back to maybe Akshay. Yeah, I think we could take one last question, uh, which is a very broad question, uh, Jitendra from Rohit. Uh, what are the future prospects of all this development in robotics in benefiting humanity? Ah, uh, uh, well, like all other uh, inventions, it can be used for good or bad. I I'll tell you what uh, makes what I'm most interested in, what I find most appealing. I, I like the concept of a home robot. OK, so I think that uh, I think that robots in uh, factory li assembly lines 
or robots in uh, warehouses for picking and moving things around. Okay, there are a lot of those applications. But I I I think that robots in the home, which I think should be possible in a period of like 10, 15, 20 years, that kind of time frame. And uh, why do I think that? I think that because essentially you need the ability to walk in a home, which I would argue is not going to happen with just wheeled robots. I think you need legged robots. And then you, the robot should do something useful. So basically, I, I want like a, a kind of an equivalent of a robot butler. So it can get something for me from the fridge or more. OK, maybe that's a little bit of an indulgence kind of story. But I think uh, very important is elder care. Right. So I have my parents are in their 90s. And you, you, those of you who have, uh, who have people in that kind of age group, you know that they need a lot of help with the activities of daily life. Now, either you have a, uh, an attendant or an assistant all the time, or if robots could help them, it would, I think, be very useful. So to me, that's not a, that, that would definitely be benefiting humanity. If you can benefit old people, stay in their homes and live more useful lives. Right. I'm pretty sure with your research and the other research, right, we should be able to achieve that much before 10, 15 years. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see. We'll, but uh, thank you very much. And I apologize to everybody because uh, we started late and uh, I hope it's not, it was not too annoying, so. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Nabin or Manik, do you want to take control back? Uh, thanks. I think we're good to wrap up. Thank you, Jitendra. That was a really nice talk. And uh, I hope uh, we'll see the success of your research in the years to come. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you, Manik. Thank you, all the colleagues, for being uh, here and uh, all your questions. And look forward to more interactions in uh, real life. I have been at to IIC Bangalore, but only, it was pre pre COVID. So I look forward to seeing you in the real world someday. <laughs>